Chapter 32, Appendix 5. John Calvin's Institute. Book 2, Chapter 8, The Fourth Commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labour, and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. The purport of the commandment is that being dead to our own affections and works. A footnote by the author. That is, those who have been regenerated, and such are the children of God, not those christened, as Calvin relates to, by baptism. We meditate on the kingdom of God, and in order to such meditation, we have recourse to the means which he has appointed. But, as this command stands in peculiar circumstances apart from the others, the mode of expression must be somewhat different. Early Christian writers are wont to call it typical. Here the author's footnote cites the Epistle of Barnabas, chapter 2 and chapter 13, as containing the external observance of a day which was abolished with other types of the advent of Christ. This is indeed true, but it leaves the half of the matter untouched. Wherefore we must look deeper for our exposition and attend to three cases in which it appears to me that the observance of this commandment consists. First, under the rest of the seventh days, the divine lawgiver meant to furnish the people of Israel with a type of the spiritual rest by which believers were to cease from their own works and allow God to work in them. Secondly, he meant that there should be a stated day on which they should assemble to hear the law and perform religious rites, or which at least they should specially employ in meditating on the works and be thereby trained in piety. Thirdly, he meant that servants and those who lived under the authority of others should be indulged with a day of rest, and thus have some intermission from labour. Section 29. Explanation of the first purpose is this, the showing forth of the spiritual rest. This is the primary objective of the precept. God is therein set forth as our sanctifier, and hence we must abstain from work that the work of God in us may not be hindered. We are taught in many passages, Numbers 13.22, Ezekiel 20.12, 22.8, 23.38, Jeremiah 17.21, and 27, Isaiah 56.2, and Nehemiah 9.14, that this adumbration of spiritual rest held a primary place in the Sabbath. Indeed, there is no commandment, the observance of which the Almighty more strictly enforces, when he would intimate by the prophets that religion was entirely subverted. He complains that his Sabbaths were polluted, violated, not kept, not hallowed, as if, after it was, entirely neglected. There remained, there remained nothing in which he could be honoured. The observance of it he eulogises in the highest terms, and hence, among other divine privileges, the faithful set an extraordinary value on the revelation of the Sabbath, in Nehemiah, the Levites, in the public assemblies, thus speak. Thou madest known unto them thy holy Sabbath, and commandest them precepts, statutes and laws, by the hand of Moses thy servant. You see the singular honour which it holds among all the precepts of the law. All this tends to celebrate the dignity and mystery which is most admirably expressed by Moses and his equal. Thus in Exodus, Verily, my Sabbath shall you keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. Ye shall keep my Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Every one that defileth it shall be surely put to death. For whosoever doth any work therein, that soul shall be cut off from among the people. Six days may work be done, but in the seventh is the Sabbath of rest holy to the Lord. Whosoever doth any work on the Sabbath day he shall surely be put to death. Wherefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations, for a perpetual covenant. It is a sign between me and the children of Israel forever. Exodus 31, 13-17. Ezekiel is still more full, but the sum of what he says amounts to this, that the Sabbath is a sign by which Israel might know that God is their sanctifier. If our sanctification consists in the mortification of our own will, the analogy between the external sign and the thing signifies is most appropriate. 
We must rest entirely in order that God may work in us. We must resign our own wills, yield up our hearts, abandon all lusts and flesh in hope. We must desist from all the acts of our own mind, from the acts of our own mind, that God working in us, we may rest in him, as the Apostle teaches, Hebrews 3.13 and 4.3.9. Section 30. The number 7, denoting perfection in Scripture. This commandment may, in that respect, denote the perpetuity of the Sabbath and its completion at the last day. The complete cessation was represented to the Jews by the observance of one day in seven, which, that it might be more religiously attended to, the Lord recommended by his own example. For it is no small incitement to the zeal of man to know that he is engaged in imitating his Creator. Should anyone expect some secret meaning in the number seven, this being in Scripture the number of perfection, it may have been selected not without cause to perpetuity. In accordance with this, Moses concludes his description of the secession of the day and night on the same day on which he relates that the Lord rested from his works. Another probable reason for the number may be the Lord intended that the Sabbath never should be completed before the arrival of the last day. We here begin our blessed rest in him and daily make new progress in it, but because we must still wage an incessant warfare with the flesh, it shall not be consummated until the fulfilment of the prophecy in Isaiah. From one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Isaiah 66 verse 23. In other words, when God shall be all in all. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 28. It may seem, therefore, that by the seventh day the Lord delineated to his people the future perfection of his Sabbath, at the last day, that by continual meditation on the Sabbath, their whole lives aspire to this perfection. Section 31. Taking a simpler view of the commandment, the number is of no consequence, provided we maintain the doctrine of a perpetual rest from all our works, and, at the same time, avoid a superstitious observance of days, the ceremonial part of the commandment abolished by the advent of Christ. Should these remarks on the number seem to any somewhat far-fetched, I have no objection to their taking it more simply, that the Lord appointed a certain day on which his people might be trained, under the tutelage of the law, to meditate constantly on the spiritual rest and fixed upon the seventh, either because he foresaw it would be sufficient, or in order that his own example might operate as a stronger stimulus, or at least to remind men that the Sabbath was appointed for no other purpose than to render them conformable to their Creator. It is of little consequence which of these be adopted, provided we lose not sight of the principal thing delineated, i.e., the mystery of perpetual resting from our works. To the contemplation of this, the Jews were every now and then called by the prophets, lest they should think a carnal cessation from their labour sufficient. Besides the passages already quoted, there is the following. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call it the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honourable, and shall honour him, not doing thine own ways, nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words, then shalt thou delight thyself in the Lord. Isaiah 58 verse 13, 14. Still there can be no doubt that on the advent of our Lord Jesus Christ, the ceremonial part of the commandment was abolished. Author's footnote. The condemning power of the law in respect to the breach of the Sabbath continued over them who were under the law. The believing Jew and Gentile were reckoned dead to the law by their union to Christ in his death and resurrection. This was fulfilled by the Lord Jesus Christ in every respect, and Jerusalem and the temple was destroyed in 70 AD according to the terms and breaches of the law. He is the truth, at whose presence all the emblems vanish, the body at the sight of which the shadows disappear. He, I say, is the true completion of the Sabbath. We are buried with him by baptism into death, that, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in the newness of life. Romans 6 verse 4. Hence, 
as the Apostle elsewhere says, Let no man therefore judge you in meat, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ, Colossians 2, 16 and 17, meaning by body the whole essence of the truth, as is well explained in that passage. This is not contented with one day, but requires the whole course of our lives until being completely dead to ourselves. We are filled with the life of God. Christians, therefore, should have nothing to do with a superstitious observance of days. Section 32. The second and third purposes of the commandment explained. These twofold and perpetual. This confirmed of religious assemblies. The two other cases ought not to be classed with ancient shadows, but are adopted to every age. The Sabbath being abridged, there is still room amongst us for to assemble on a stated day for the hearing of the word, the breaking of the mystical bread, the public prayer, and secondly, to give our servants and labourers relaxation from their labour. It cannot be doubted that the Lord provided for both in the commandment of the Sabbath. The former is abundantly evinced by the mere practice of the Jews. The latter Moses has expressed in Deuteronomy in the following terms. The seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou nor thy son nor thy daughter nor thy manservant nor thy maid, that thy manservant and thy maidservant may rest as well as thou. Deuteronomy 5.14 Likewise in Exodus that thine ox and thine ass may rest, and the son of thy handmaid and the stranger may be refreshed. Exodus 23, verse 12. Who can deny that both are equally applicable to us as to the Jews? Religious meetings are enjoined to us by the word of God. Their necessity, experience, itself sufficiently demonstrates. But unless these meetings are stated and have fixed days allocated to them, how can they be held? We must, as the Apostle expresses it, do all things decently and in order. 1 Corinthians 14.50 So, impossible however it would be to preserve decency and order without this politic arrangement, that the dissolution of it would instantly lead to the disturbance and ruin of the church. But if the reason for which the Lord appointed a Sabbath to the Jews was equally applicable to us, no man can assert that it is a matter with which we have nothing to do. Our most provident and indulgent parent has been pleased to provide for our wants no less than for the wants of the Jews. Why it may be asked, do we not hold daily meetings and thus avoid the distraction of days? Would that we were privileged to do so. Spiritual wisdom undoubtedly deserves to have some portion of every day devoted to it. But if, owing to the weakness of many, daily meetings cannot be held and charity will not allow us to exact more of them, why should we not adopt the rule which the will of God has obviously imposed upon us? Section 33. Of the observance of the Lord's Day in answer to those who complain that the Christian people are thus trained in Judaism. Objection. I'm obliged to dwell a little longer on this because some restless spirits are now making an outcry about the observance of the Lord's Day. They complain that Christian people are trained in Judaism because some observance of days is retained. My reply is that those days are observed by us without Judaism because in this matter we differ widely from the Jews. We do not celebrate it with most minute formality as a ceremony or which we imagine that a spiritual mystery is typified but we adopt it as a necessary remedy for preserving order in the church. Paul informs us that Christians are not to be judged in respect to this observance because it is a shadow of something to come, Colossians 2.16 and accordingly he expresses a fear lest his labours among them, Galatians, among the Galatians should prove in vain because they still observe days, Galatians 4, 10 and 11 and he tells the Romans that it is superstitious to make one day differ from another, Romans 14 verse 5 but who except those restless men, does not see what the observance is to which the Apostle refers. Those persons had no regard to the politic and ecclesiastical arrangement, both by retaining the days as types of spiritual things that are in so far observing the glory of Christ and the light of the Gospel. 
they did not desist from manual labour on the ground of its interfering with sacred study and meditation, but as a kind of religious observance, because they dreamed that, by their cessation from labour, they were cultivating the mysteries which had of old been committed to them. It was, I say, against this preposterous observance of days that the Apostle embays, and not against the legitimate selection which is subservient to the peace of Christian society. For in the churches established by him, this was the use for which the Sabbath was retained. He tells the Corinthians to set the first day apart for collection of contributions for the relief of the brethren in Jerusalem. 1 Colossians 16.2 If superstition is dreaded, there was more danger of keeping the Jewish Sabbath than the Lord's Day, as Christians now do, it being expedient to overthrow superstition. The Jewish Holy Day was abolished, and a thing necessary to retain decency, order and peace in the church. Another day was appointed for its purpose. Section 34. Grounds of this institution. There is no kind of superstitious necessity. The sum of the commandment. It was not, however, without a reason that the early church substituted what we call the Lord's Day for the Sabbath, the resurrection of our Lord being the end of the accomplishment of that true rest, which the ancient Sabbath typified. This day, by which types are abolished, serves to warn Christians against adhering to a shadowy ceremony. I do not cling so to the number seven as to bring the church under bondage to it. Nor do I condemn churches for holding their meetings on other solemn days, provided they guard against superstition. This they will do if they employ those days merely for the observance of discipline and regular order. The whole may be thus summed up. As the truth was delivered typically to the Jews, so it is imparted to us without figure. First, that during our whole lives we may aim at a constant rest from our own works, in order that the Lord may work in us by his Spirit. Secondly, that every individual, as he has opportunity, may diligently exercise himself in private, in pious meditation on the works of God, and at the same time that all may observe the legitimate order appointed by the Church, for the hearing of the Word, the administration of the sacraments, and public prayer. And thirdly, that we may avoid oppressing those who are subject to us in this way, we get quit of the trifling of false prophets, who in the latter times instilled Jewish ideas into the people, alleging that nothing was abrogated but what was ceremonial and in the commandment. This they term in the language of the taxation of the seventh day, while the moral part remained this, the observance of one day in seven. But this is nothing else than an insult to the Jews, by changing the day and yet mentally attributing to it the same sanctity, thus retaining the same typical distinction of days as had place amongst the Jews, and of a truth we see what profit they had made of such doctrine. Those who cling to their constitutions go thrice as far as the Jews in the gross and carnal superstition of Sabbatism, so that the rebukes which we read in Isaiah 1, 13, 58 and 13 apply as much to those of the present day. As to those to whom the prophets address them, we must be careful, however, to observe the general doctrine, this, in order that religion may neither be lost nor languish amongst us, we must diligently attend on our religious assemblies and duly avail ourselves of the external aids which tend to promote the worship of God. William Tyndale's Observation on the Sabbath, 1563 As for the Sabbath, a great matter. We be lords over the Sabbath, and may yet change it into the Monday, or any other day, as we see need, or may make every tenth day holy day, only if we see cause. Why? We may make every two weeks, if it were expedient, and not one enough to teach the people. Neither was it there any cause to change it from Saturday, than to put a difference between us and the Jews, and lest we should become servants to the day, after their superstition. Neither needed we any holy day at all, if the people might be taught without it. Quotation from John Frith, 1533. John Frith was a companion of William Tyndale. Frith was martyred, burnt at the stake. His arrest was issued by Thomas More himself. And concerning the abrogation or alteration of ceremonies, 
we have a godly example of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was instituted and commanded of God to be kept by the children of Israel, notwithstanding, because it was a sign or a ceremony, and did signify unto them that it was God which sanctified them with his spirit, and not themselves with their holy works, and because also that all ceremonies and shadows ceased when Christ came, so that they might be done or left undone indifferently. Our forefathers, which were in the beginning of the church, did abrogate the Sabbath to the intent that men might have an example of Christ's liberty, and that they might know that neither the keeping of the Sabbath nor of any other day is necessary according to St. Paul. He observed days, times, months. I am afraid of you, that I have laboured in vain towards you. How be it? Because it was necessary that a day should be reserved, in the which the people might come together to hear the word of God, they ordained instead of the Sabbath, which was Saturday, the next day following, which is Sunday. And although they might have kept the Saturday with the Jews as a thing indifferent, yet did they much better to overset the day to be perpetual memory that we are free and not bound to any day, but that we may do all lawful works to the pleasure of God and profit of our neighbours. We are in manner as superstitious on the Sunday as they were of their Saturday. Yea, and we are much madder. For the Jews have the word of God for their Saturday, which is the seventh day, and they were commanded to keep the seventh day solemn. And we have not the word of God for us, but rather against us. For we keep not the seventh day, as the Jews do, but the first, which is not commanded by God's law. But Paul addeth that no man judge us in concerning holy days, meats, and other exterior things. Yea, and in no wise all he that would observe them counted them more holy than other days. For they were instituted that the people should come together to hear the word, receive the sacraments, and give thanks to God. That done, they may return to their households and do their business as well as any other day. He that thinketh that a man sinneth, which worketh on the holy day, if he be a weak or ignorant, ought better to be instructed, and so to leave his hold. But if he be obstinate, and persevere in his sentence, he is not of God, but of the devil, for he maketh sin in such as God leaveth free.'